In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Christ is in our midst. He is in this gospel takes place right after the reading we had last Sunday. After he heals the demoniacs, he crosses back over the sea, and he comes to this place. And as I understand it, there's a big crowd around him, and they're following him all over. They hear about his miracles. They hear about his, his new teaching with such authority. And when he's in this one house, they bring to him a paralytic, and he says, your sins are forgiven. Take heart, your sins are forgiven. And it says the scribes, the lawyers, the, the authority of their, of their faith, they start mumbling to each other, this is blasphemy. And it's interesting how the Lord says, uh, how it reads, the Lord knowing their hearts say, why do you have such thoughts, such evil in your hearts? How often have we tried to excuse a behavior or justify a behavior or condemn a behavior by saying, well, you don't know what's in his heart. God knows. Like someone does something that's very challenging for us, they seem selfish or they seem short and ugly towards others, and we might say to justify them, well, you don't know their heart. He may seem rough on the outside, but he's a, he's a teddy bear on the inside. Or on the other side of that, they do something and you don't like it, and we think, well, judge, God will judge them. St. Paisios warns us about such a statement, God will judge them, as it's like a humble curse that we are presuming God's judgment on them because obviously I say something like this because I didn't like what they did. And I'm not going to judge him, but I'm asking God to judge them. So he, he cautions and says that's not a, a prayer, it's not a humble thing to say, it's a it's a humble curse, kind of like a humble brag. Have you heard of a humble brag? I went to the gym today and I only could get 350 pounds up. Yeah, that's a lot of weight, right? Ah, I was a bad day. A humble curse. I'm not judging him, but I'm asking God to judge him. We should avoid that. We, we already know God's going to judge all of us. And I, and I love the one that says, you see something terrible and you're like, there's a special place in hell for people like that. And I, I struggle with that one a lot because there's a special place in hell for all of us. Because as we said, as he says in this gospel, he knows their heart. He knows my heart. He knows your heart. Not just those whom we disagree with. Not with just those who we don't like what they're saying or what they're doing. He knows all of our hearts. And that's something we should pay a lot of attention to. In Paul's a letter, he says, if you can do these things, you should do it. Right? If you have skills, use them. Don't just sit idly by. God has given you gifts to put them to use. If you teach, teach. If you can sing, sing. If you can help the poor, help the poor. If you can give money, give money. But it's not just enough to do it. He kind of goes so far to say, with a humble heart, with gratitude, with hopefulness. And so it's not enough that we come to church. It's not enough that we confess our faith. But we have to put our faith into action and nourish it in our hearts. That we do, God loves a cheerful giver. These sort of ideas that we do not out of compulsion because God told me to do it, but out of love. Sometimes we have to compel ourselves to do things. Sometimes we don't feel that love right away. Sometimes it's hard. I don't want to. 
I have other things in mind. And God knows this too. But we strive for that perfection by doing first, by praying about it, by committing ourselves to Christ and say, if I'm committing myself to Christ, I have to love these people I don't agree with. God knows what's in our hearts. He is great and merciful, compassionate, understanding, all these things. And He is just. We don't deserve His love, but He loves us just the same. There's nothing we can do to earn it. But He says, because you love me and because I love you, I want you to do these things. Not out of fear of hell or for the promise of heaven, but for the love of the Father, for the love of Jesus Christ, as a gratitude towards what He has done for us on the cross. There's a few times it reads that He's seeing what's in His heart, seeing what's in their heart. He calls them out in front of everyone. Why do you have such arguments? Why do you have such disputes in your heart? And they never answer. They never confess. They never apologize. They never show struggle. They just get bent out of shape and they're like, well, we have to end him. Judgment belongs to the Lord. But when they experience this judgment, they want to get back. Right? They eventually conspired to kill Christ because he knew what was in their hearts. Sometimes our heart is not where we want it to be. Like, I want to forgive this person, but it's so hard. That's something we offer up in prayer. Say, Lord, I'm trying, but it's hard. I still hurt. I still struggle. And that's something we offer up in confession. I believe your words, but it's hard for me to follow through. Someone asked me recently about habitual sin. I know I'm probably going to do it again, so do I confess it? I say yes, because we continue to struggle against it, even though it's habitual. Well, I know I'll do it again, so why should I say it now? Because we continue to feel shame for it, we continue to feel guilt for it, and we continue to struggle, so we continue to offer it up in prayer, in confession, in our personal prayers, to help rid me of this passion, to help rid me of this sin. The challenge or the problem becomes worse when we no longer feel the shame, when we no, feel, no longer feel guilty, when we're no longer resisting the habitual sin, when we give ourselves into it. That's, that's the problem. Not that we habitually sin, but when we stop resisting, when we give into it without fighting it. We may succumb to it, we may fail to it, but we don't go down without a fight. The Lord knows what's in our heart. He also sees our struggles, not just some of our bad thoughts, not just some of our thanksgiving, but our struggles. There's lots of things we can struggle over with. Sometimes we don't even think to offer it up in prayer whether it's work-related, whether it's family-related, whether it's health-related, political-related, socially-related, all these things we struggle with, but we keep secret. But we can't keep it secret from the Lord. But He wants us to say it. Because when we keep it secret, it's like we're hiding it. We may be ashamed of it, and that's okay. But when we keep it secret, it's almost like we're denying it. And especially during confession, 
The Lord already knows, so why do we have to say it? Because there's a way of making it real when you say it. There's a way of finding accountability for your own actions when you have to confess to it. There's a way of, I said it once, I don't ever want to have to say it again, so I will work harder and I will ask for help to overcome this or outgrow this behavior. Why do we have to say it? God knows our hearts. Why do we have to pray at all? Even our prayers will say, you, Lord, know what my true needs are better than I know myself. Why do we have to say it? Because there's humility in saying, I need help. You ever watch a child struggle with laces or something, like struggling to do something, and there's an instinct to just go and rescue them. But sometimes you have to hold back and see if they can do it. And then if they can't do it, hold back some more and see if they will ask for help. There's no shame in asking for help. There's pride in not asking for help. When we ask the Lord and through prayer, we humble ourselves and say, I need this thing. Like God knows this, but articulating, it's recognizing, yeah, I really need this thing. I can't do it on my own. I don't want to be isolated. I don't want to be alone. I need this. God knows what's in our heart. We have to humble ourselves to express it. Half the time, I don't think <laughs> when we do pray, it's an act of asking God to change something in our lives. But when we articulate it and say what we need, we can recognize the things we need to change in our lives. I saw this silly thing. Guy said, hey, John, can you pray for me? He says, yes, yes, I'll pray for you. What's wrong? He says, I need to pass a drug test. <laughs> He's like, I'm not praying for that. That's not something prayers are going to help other than I will pray that you get help if you have a drug problem. I will pray for you to overcome this, not to pass a test, but to clean your life. Our prayer is much to move us when we pray to God for us, for others. As we heard in the epistle today, what can you do for others? When we pray for someone, what is the blessing that we can become for others? He knows what's in our heart. I always felt like when I came home, my father always knew what I was up to. And that would move me to kind of preemptively tell him what I was up to. Because it's always better if I confess it to him and get discipline rather than lie to him and myself and everyone else. And then he already knows and he knows I'm lying. God is the same way. He already knows. But he wants us to be mature in our faith, to trust in him that we could tell him anything and get rid of anything we don't like that's in our heart. We ask him, help me remove this. We often focus in the gospel on the paralytic's faith. But here he calls out everyone that was watching. I know what's in your heart. And that should be a blessing for us. Because we can't really hide anything from him. He already knows how much more easier it should be for us to make that confession, to ask for that help. 
He already knows. Amen.